living the life that someone else wanted me to live, not the life that I wanted to live. Like everyone wanted me to be a doctor, so I became a doctor, right? My, my dad ran an accounting firm and wanted me to take it over, so I took it over. And it's incredible how many people feel like, you know, they didn't really have the chance to determine the life they wanted to live. So I do feel the best thing we can do for our children is live our best life and model for them, this is what it looks like to go after your passion. Even if you fail, so what if you fail, right? Why, why do we get raised with this notion that failing is the worst thing ever? Failing's not the worst thing ever. When you fail, you learn. Hello everyone, I'm Denise Gorant. Welcome to Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. Thanks for joining us as we speak with experts, authors, parents, and even young adults to explore the transition from parenting our young children to building healthy relationships with our now adults. Hopefully we'll grow together, learn about ourselves, our young adults, and of course, when to bite our tongues. We are so happy you're with us. So let's get started. Welcome back to Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. I'm so happy Ellen is joining me today. She's in Prague, but we're still connecting remotely, and I think it's going to work. I'm so glad you're with me today, Ellen. Today, we're talking about empty nest syndrome. I found out recently that this really is a syndrome with symptoms and treatments on the Mayo Clinic website. Everyone listening certainly knows the symptoms, but guess what the best prevention is? Directly from the Mayo Clinic site, it says... If your last child is about to leave home and you're worried about the empty nest syndrome, plan ahead. Look for new opportunities in your personal and professional life. So that's what we're talking about today. It's our turn. It's your turn. It's your turn to build a life after the empty nest, to find your bliss. And we're so happy to welcome Julia Pimsler. I met Julia at a coffee shop in New York. I was staying with a friend and walking their dog. When I stopped in this coffee shop on my way home, Julia noticed I was wearing a college cap of her alma mater, and we started to chat. I was very intrigued with her work as a scaling coach, mentor, a mindset expert, and founder of Million Dollar Women. Now, we're all not wanting to become millionaires or millionaire women or men, but many of us are working to find meaning in our lives when the nest is empty. That's what I'm hoping Julia will address. And full disclosure, she did treat me to my cup of coffee. Oh, how I love New York. Ellen and I have been talking about having an episode on the importance of building our own lives after the kids are gone. Sometimes the nest can seem really empty when the parenting is over, and we've not taken the time to build an independent life for ourselves. So I'm anxious to talk to Julia about her own experiences, the women she mentors, and how she might help us give that day-to-day parenting a big heave change our mindset, and spend some time building our own lives and fulfilling our own dreams. Ellen's going to tell us a bit more about Julia, and then we'll get started. I can't wait to talk to Julia. She's a scaling coach, something I want to hear more about, a mindset expert, we all need this, a speaker and best-selling author. She's the founder of Million Dollar Women, a New York City-based social venture, which has helped thousands of women entrepreneurs scale up their businesses. Prior to that, She founded and built Little Pim, language learning for young children, into a multi-million dollar company. She also shares interviews with women entrepreneurs on her guests on her live TV show and has podcasts of her own. She lives in New York City, has two teenage sons, and her mantra is fortune favors the brave. But after years of parenting, it's hard to be brave, especially many times for women. So welcome, Julia. And if we missed anything about you, please fill in the gaps for us. Thank you. It's so great to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. So you want to get started? Is there anything else you want to say, Julia, or should we just get started? No, let's just jump right in. Okay, so big letters on your website. Go after the bigger version of your dreams. This seems like really what your business is all about. And it also seems you work mostly with women and they've sort of started to work, but you're ready to help them go big. I have to say that I know many women after the kids leave They're chomping at the bit to make an impact, whether it be in business or in the community. 
Can you share some stories of women you've worked with that might relate to our listeners, people who want to get started? You know, they might not want to make a million dollars, but they might want to impact a million people too. Yes. So how do you take that step? Well, yeah, funny enough, our tagline is for women who want to go big and make a big impact. So what a lot of our women have in common is that, yes, they want to make more money in their business, and many of them are actually the chief breadwinners in their families, but they also want to do something that's going to help move things forward in our world. So impact is really important in our community, whether people are serving on nonprofit boards or donating a percentage of their receipts to some kind of a cause or just mentoring in their communities where sometimes they're the first entrepreneur you know, in their community. And I will say that our community over indexes women over 40, and we have a lot of women who are on second and even third careers. Um, I'm thinking of one woman, Valencia McClure, who's based out of Fort Worth, Texas. And for 20 years, she worked in an energy company where she was head of relations between sponsors and philanthropy and things like that. She had a big P&L that she ran. But then she actually got breast cancer in her late 40s. And happily, she recovered, largely because she had this essential oils treatment that she felt was really, really helpful. And when she went back to work, she realized, you know, my heart's just not in this anymore. Um, I don't want to do this, even though she had a big, big salary. So she left her job took her nest egg and went and got trained in mixing essential oils. And she has now started this incredible company called the Artistry of Essential Oils, where from scratch, she had no business experience, no entrepreneurial experience. She started this company. She's about two years in now. And when she came to us, you know, she had very few customers. There wasn't a whole lot going on on the income side. And then the pandemic hit. It would have been very easy to just say, forget it. You know, that was a good idea, but now it's a pandemic. I'm going to go back into corporate America. But thanks in part to our community and encouragement and our you know, coaching and business classes, she quickly shifted to selling direct to consumer because she was going to be selling in hotels and spas. And of course, all that went away overnight, as we remember. But she started this amazing direct to consumer business. And now here she is. She has a deal with HSN, Home Shopping Network. She has grown her direct to consumer business up to being, you know, almost a million dollar business. And she's just on fire with this essential oils company. So those are the stories we love of women who just said, you know what, I'm just going to go for it, even though I don't know what's going to happen on the other end of that decision. And sometimes the universe aligns to find you the right support and community and coaching to make it happen. Go ahead, Ellen. I was just going to say it's such a great story. And I was wondering, too, I think you were going to say, Denise, did she have a great have a, a family as well? That I was thinking about that. I was also thinking about like she had to sort of push beyond her fear. Absolutely. Before you came on, Denise and I were talking about how, I think Denise, you had said that the fear of failure, you think is what holds more people back than anything else. I really believe that. I would love to know what Julia says. Yeah. 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 Well, a lot of that is socialization as women. I mean, having worked with thousands of women now who are business owners, I see some themes, as you can imagine. And I'm sure Ellen, you know, sees themes in her practice that, that she can speak to. And I'd love to learn from you as well. But the theme that I see is that we're not really socialized as women to be risk takers. We're socialized to be nurturers. We're socialized to be good communicators. But we often are given messages either explicitly or implicitly that our highest value is in serving others. And while there's nothing wrong with serving others, it often comes at the expense of pursuing our own dreams or taking risks on our own lives to do the things that really light us up. And so that's where communities like ours come into play. You know, we're not the only community for women entrepreneurs, but what we really focus on is what is the go big mindset? Because you can't even start teaching someone business skills until you've addressed the mindset issues. You know, if you if you just jump in with like, hey, here's how you do a PL and let's get your marketing going and let's work on your strategy, it's overwhelming and you don't have the foundation. The foundation is undoing some of that socialization that says that you're somehow not being a good mother or not being a good wife or not being a good sister or daughter if you're pursuing your dreams, which sounds crazy when you say it out loud, but that socialization is happening. I don't know what what you think. Does that resonate with you? I 100% agree with you. I want to get on to mindset after a minute, but I want to say something. Something I've said to many people through my life is that one thing I notice, if you notice in high schools, and they're even saying in colleges, the girls are the leaders, the girls are head of the class, the girls have got the highest GPA, blah, blah, blah. The boys are getting in trouble 
Um, some of them. I'm not. I'm being very. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm generalizing very, very yeah. much. But there are studies behind these things, so you're not exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. And sometimes I think the reason is girls are afraid to step over the line. The ri- the whole risk. You know, the guys are like, "This is not. You know, I'm really not that interested in history. I'd rather be doing this." So they don't put their emphasis on history. They put their emphasis on you know what they want to do. But the girls in high school are just pleasing. And then people say, "Okay, but then why do the guys become the CEOs? Because they were risk takers. Because they stepped over the line." And we need to learn to do that at some point. You're absolutely right. I think that we were rewarded. I know that I was All raised us, like this, yeah. you know, to to check the boxes, mm-hmm. to get the A, to get the, the gold star on your homework, right. right? There's a lot of affirmation seeking. Yeah. And entrepreneurialism is more about, you know, how do I disrupt, right. right? How do I fly in the face of what's happening out there? And it's full of risk taking. I mean, to start your own business, you know, you have to spend down the money you have. You have to spend money you don't have. You have to put things on credit cards. You have to believe in yourself so much that you're willing to take those risks and believe that they'll pay off. And it's not a one-time risk. It's not just when you start your company. It's over and over and over again. It's investing in marketing. It's hiring a new team. It's going after funds. If you're raising money, you know, I raised $6 million for my prior company, Little Pim, you know, you have to believe that you're building a multi-million dollar company or else, you know, how do you engage other people to invest in you? And you really believe, and I, I took your mindset test, you know, that you go on once you've gotten the book and you can go oh, on. Yes, the, the assessment. <laughs> I actually did terrible because as you're talking, I feel fear coming up in my stomach. I, of all people, lack that confidence and that belief in myself. I listen to you and I even though you're such a high achiever, well, I mean, you've but really, I take you know, risks and I, yeah. I do things, but I never, it's all, you know, you've heard of that imposter phenomenon, right? Where you keep doing well, but you keep thinking, okay, someone's going to catch me. Someone's going to find out I'm not that good. I think I talked about the imposter phenomenon when I was 23 years old, but now you're 65 and you have this idea. Number one, how do you know if it's any good? And number two, you're thinking about your retirement and now you're going to take all your money and put it in this idea. How do you build that confidence in yourself to take that plunge? Yes. Well, a lot of it is about being in community. I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, part of why I started a women's entrepreneur community is that when I was building my first business, Little Pim, the language teaching business for young children, that when I turned into a multimillion dollar business, I joined several entrepreneur communities, one main one, and I got so much great business value out of it, but it was about 85% men. And while I did make some really good friends in there, I always felt like these are not my people, right? It was like a lot of guys who just had a whole different set of issues than I did. I had two little boys at home. You know, my kids were, my boys were three and six when I was building my business. So I was trying to balance, you know, meetings with the kindergarten teacher and going on field trips. And most of these men had a wife at home handling that. Right. So I just didn't feel it was the same set of issues, plus the things we're talking about, the socialization of, you know, perfectionism and not wanting to take risks. But that being said, I still got so much affirmation around the risk taking from being around other entrepreneurs. And that's kind of when the light bulb went off of what if you could mix those two things? What if you could have, you know, all of the joy and sisterhood and encouragement of being in a women's group? And probably everyone listening has been in some kind of women's group, you know, even if it was in college or just a group of women you go out for drinks with or whatever, you know, that great feeling of showing up and feeling like, ah, these are my people, right? What if you could mix that with the business support and the business tips and the coaching and the mentorship And so that's what we did when we created Million Dollar Women is a place where women could show up as their full selves, as moms, as women in their 50s, as many women in their 60s, you know, as people who are dealing with empty nest issues. And you don't have to say, oh, today I'm a businesswoman and I have to pretend all that doesn't exist. No, it's all part of the same trying to build a life that works. So talk about the mindset. You say the go big mindset is really a set of beliefs and allows you to stay positive, move forward, and face setbacks as you achieve your goals. How does that work? Tell us how women can work on that, what they can do. Give us some tips in that area. Yeah, so my first book was Million Dollar Women, but my second book that you're quoting from is Go Big Now, which is eight essential mindset practices to overcome any obstacle and reach your goals. And the reason I felt the need to write that book is that After coaching so many women through Million Dollar Women, I realized that where we need the most help is on mindset. And the book is actually for men and women, but I know that women particularly benefit from it because often 
what's in our way is ourselves. You know, women are so smart, so determined, so capable. In fact, most men I know say, oh, I would rather hire a woman <laughs> because I know she'll get the job done, right? Um, so it's not that we're not capable. It's that we engage in self-sabotage without even knowing it. Or we didn't have the right socialization or modeling to dream the big dream and to feel we could go after it. So Go Big Now is all about a set of exercises that you can do, really eight very practical mindset exercises that come out of my training as a mindset expert. I'm trained in NLP, neurolinguistic programming. And these eight exercises get you into this go big state, as I call it, which is how do you prioritize what's going to make your life feel meaningful and worth living and something you're proud of? How do you take those big risks without sort of not ever being able to sleep at night again and get into that state of confidence and know how to address the demons when they pop up? Because, right, we've all heard the, no, the Nike slogan, right? What's the Nike slogan? Do, just do it. Just right? do you it. say just do, just do it is 2 percent of the success. I want to know what the other 90% yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. So 10% of success is deciding to do right. it. Just do it, right? But it's the other 90% where we tend to get the least help and where most people fail. And the other 90% is having the go big mindset so that when you hit that first big obstacle, so that when you get that first no and that second no and that third no, or when you can't make payroll, or when someone tells you your idea is stupid, or when you you know, bring in a partner to your business and that partner embezzles $25,000 and you think, oh my God, I'm an idiot and why did I have a business in the first place? All of these things are real stories from real people I know. And so either you fold up shop when that happens, or you have the kind of mindset where you say, well, you know what? That's a speed bump. Got to find a way around it. See, and the money would play such a, uh, it would play at my age, I would be always worried about, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my whole nest egg, keep going at this. But I have to, you have to have belief that it's going to work. Well, but of course the flip side is what can you do with your money that's going to really yield some big return? Like when you run your own business, first of all, there's no ceiling on what you can pay yourself or how much your business can make. You know, we have a woman in our community who was teaching pole fitness classes, you know, like how to dance, pole dancing. Pole mm -hmm. dancing. Yes. And she was like, you know, I think I'm tired of being on my feet all day. I, I, there's got to be some other way to do this. So she came through our Million Dollar Women program and she decided to create an app that people could download and then she would send them the poll and she could teach them remotely. Well, she created this app right before the pandemic. Wow. Lockdown happened. And people went crazy for this. She got all these orders. She's sending out polls, could barely keep up with it. Three months later, she messaged me on Facebook and said, Julia, you won't believe this. I just made $108,000 in the last three months. And that's more money than I ever made in one year. And Shelly Murdoch, that's her name. She's a black woman entrepreneur in Florida, first entrepreneur in her family, is now on track to make $2 million with this business called Fit to Flaunt. You can go follow them on Instagram. Say it again, Fit to what? Fit, and then the number two, flaunt, F-L-A-U-N-T. Oh, fit to flaunt. I love following okay, them okay. because, you know, I have a lot of stuff coming up about, you know, women's empowerment and business and numbers. And then all of a sudden I get these pole dancing women. And it always makes my day. I think that's great. <laughs> so I mean, how do you suggest you follow them? But that's Instagram. the kind of thing. I, mean, I think what you said earlier about women always having great ideas, you know, women after they've raised their family, they're thinking, gosh, there's so much I could do. But it is all about changing your mindset and making a real step to do it. Well, that's the first step. And then the second step is to actually go get the business skills because, you know, I was not, I did not go to business school. I don't have a finance background. I studied film and women's studies at Yale, and then I got an MFA in film. So I didn't have that business background. And part of why I was able to build a multi-million dollar company with the, the language teaching company I referenced is I did go get trained. I did invest in myself. I did join communities and hire coaches and hire mentors. And so I think that's, often the missing piece for women, like what you just said earlier of like, well, what if I blow my whole nest egg? Well, by the way, you could, you could blow your whole nest egg, or you could join a program, be part of other women doing this, learn the best practices and make sure that doesn't happen. Well, you know, the, the other thing that I think is so interesting too, we've talked a lot about how to make money, but there are a lot of listeners too, who have already made their money and they still want to find meaning. Meaning isn't just about making money or doing Absolutely. that. And I think there's a lot in what you're saying that has to do with just finding your bliss that can really relate to people in their 60s who are like, I'm done with making money. I've, I can live comfortably or, or well enough, but how do I 
how do I go big in my life? Yeah. And, and, and I think Valencia's story speaks to that, right? The woman who did the yes. essential oils company where this had had such a big impact on her life and getting over cancer. And she wanted to help other people get access to yeah. essential oils and the whole life, you know, healthy lifestyle that goes along with that. That's a big impact she wants to make. But then we have other women who are creating curriculum for schools or who are going in and doing, you know, diversity work in companies. We have consultants, we have lawyers, we have accountants, and most of them, what they're doing is their passion. Like they are living out their bliss by doing the work. So yes, there is a first step to figure out, okay, what do I want to do? And there's a great book called Finding Your North Star by Martha Beck. I don't know if either of you have read that. Mm, yeah. We all need to find our North Star, right, Ellen? <laughs> oh, totally. Right. Well, some people know. Some people know what they want to do, and it's about helping them do it. And some people haven't quite figured out what they want to do. So that book is to help you figure out what you want to do. If you know what you want to do and you're just afraid to do it, then a book like Go Big Now is helpful, where it says, okay, let's get you to the place where you're like, yes, I'm going for it. But I think we all need a little bit of push whether it's being confident in our ideas or knowing that we have a good idea, but even sometimes it's just kind of realizing, again, getting back to that North Star idea, but also that you feel like you can take time to do the things that you want to do, even if they aren't going to make money, even if they aren't, you know, what somebody else might think is what you should be doing with your retirement years. And so it's, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot to be said for like you know yeah. finding that mindset, regardless of what path you want to take, and then also trying to link this up with your with your kids too. You know, how does my mindset impact my relationship with my kids? Is it is it going to get in the way? Is it going to you know? I, I think that was something that, that Denise and I were, were talking about before. This idea that it's hard to be a parent and parenting never stops. Well, but that does bring us full circle to what we said yeah. in the beginning about, you know, being raised to be nurturers and, you know, take care of everybody but ourselves. I think the downside of that we don't realize is that sometimes we forego our own dreams in order to take care of our children. And what kind of a model are we actually giving them, right? Especially our daughters. Exactly. Like, is that what you want your daughters to do is squash their dreams and just give to everybody else and then wake up when their kids move out and say, oh, wait, I never did what I wanted to do. I mean, funny enough, Daniel Pink, who's an author I really like, he has the book Drive and a couple other books. He's coming out with a book in February called Regret. And he did this study mm -hmm. of thousands of people around the world to find out what is the number one regret that people have all over the world, across cultures. And can you guess what it is, Ellen or Denise? Not doing what you wanted to do, not taking risks. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. The number one yeah. regret, well, it's actually more specific than that, but, but t it was pretty much that. It was living the life that someone else wanted me to live, not the life that I wanted to live. Like everyone wanted me to be a doctor, so I became a doctor, right? My, my dad ran an accounting firm and wanted me to take it over, so I took it over. And it's incredible how many people feel like, you know, they didn't really have the chance to determine the life they wanted to live. So I do feel the best thing we can do for our children is live our best life and model for them. This is what it looks like to go after your passion, even if you fail. So what if you fail? Right. Why, why do we get raised with this notion that failing is the worst thing ever? Failing is not the worst thing ever. When you fail, you learn. Yeah, everything you're saying yeah. is is right. And I think Ellen was getting to what I sort of wanted to touch on, too. I do think, Ellen and Julia, I'd love to hear your input on this. The whole mindset idea and the go big mindset can be used, I think, for even identifying your North Star or going after your North Star, whether it be something in business or in your life. You know, I've even thought in my 60s, maybe I'm going to join the Peace Corps. Maybe I'm going to go do something I wish I had done when I was 25. People that may have yeah. never studied abroad. There's so many programs for seniors now where you can really do things that you weren't able to do, but you have to have the confidence or as Julia would say, the mindset to take that stuff, to do the research, to get yourself there and step out of your comfort zone. So it's not always about the million dollars or the great idea or whatever it might be, but doing something you've always wanted to do. When I tell people, I think I'm going to join the Peace Corps, they look at me like I've lost my mind. Denise, you should be relaxing. You should be whatever. Well, I need to be productive. Right. Maybe that's not what lights you up, right? And, and one of the key things I, I teach in the book is that what other people think of you is none of your business. It's just literally none of your business. Every time you start thinking, oh God, do they think I'm an idiot? They think that, stop, because it's none of your business. And that's the only way you can do what you want to do in life. Because 
first of all, everybody's running their opinions through their own filter, right? So no two people have the same filter. In the book, I explain it from a more, um, you know, kind of biological explanation, the RAS, the reticular activating system. We don't have to get into all that. But suffice to say that everybody has a filter through which they run the world and no two filters are the same. So even if you told me, Denise, I want to, you know, go to the Peace Corps and I said all kinds of judgmental things. Well, that's just because I'm running it through my filter. What do you care about my filter? You should only care about your own filter. So that's one piece of advice I have for anybody listening who finds themselves thinking about, oh, what do other people think of me? Anytime you're having that thought, just stop it and say it's none of my business. But that's all part of the mindset and that's all part of the confidence building and the risk taking and all of that and believing in what you want to do. It all goes together. And and part of why I wrote the book is I feel like this is not discussed enough. Like we do talk about how do you keep your physical body fit, right? We might, I mean, you and I met in a coffee shop, right? And we might have that very day said, oh, I'm going to Pilates. What are you doing? Oh, I'm going to go do yoga, right? And people have that conversation all the time. But why aren't we sharing like, here's how I overcome my negative self-talk. Here's how I psych myself up when I'm afraid to do something. Because people have these very powerful mindset practices, but we're not talking about them. We're not sharing them. It's gotten a little better since the pandemic, because frankly, I couldn't even have dreamed up a mindset test as major as the pandemic, (laughs) right? right? It's like I started writing this book on mindset, you know, a year before the pandemic, and then someone had the idea, "Hmm, let's shut everyone into their homes for 18 months and have ambulances going by their windows and see how they do. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a global mindset test. And I'll tell you, the people who passed it, the people who didn't get depressed or become alcoholics or get back in bed and stay there were the people who had mindset practices to get them through. So I have two questions with this then. One is, do you have any suggestions for how to get through this next wave? But also, and this is, it's kind of unfair that I give you both of these at the same time, but, you know, we've talked a lot about women and really oftentimes in this time of our life, as parents, it's not just women. And we also have a lot of men who like the podcast too. What do you, what suggestions do you have for men doing some of these going big ideas? And also how can men better support women and how can women better support men in, you know, as we're coming out of this pandemic on top of it all? So that's a lot to answer. I'm sorry, Julia. No, that, that's a, no it's a great question. And, and look, my, my first chapter, uh, in fact, I'll teach one of the keys right now because I'd love to give the listeners something they can use right away. So I have these eight mindset practices I teach. And the very first one is called Mind the Gap. And Mind the Gap comes from, if you've ever been on the London Tube and you're waiting down there, you know, they're saying, Mind the Gap, right? Mind the Gap. So it's a reminder to create a little space between what happens to you and the meaning you make of it, because this is the most fundamental thing to learn if you want to embark on having a more powerful go big mindset, is that you are in control of your mind. People who have not done any mindset work, and I've been doing mindset work for, you know, 20 years, but even if you've just done one workshop, the very first thing you learn is your thoughts are not you. You know, we have this misconception that if you have this thought, whoa, that must be the truth. That's the real me talking. No, your mind plays all kinds of tricks on you and you have to kind of take control again. I often say our mind is like a, like a puppy. Like when you take a puppy out for a walk and they're trying to like put their nose in the trash and go into the street, right? And you've got to like tug on the leash, right? To pull them back. Well, that's what our thoughts do. Our thoughts are like little puppies. They run around looking for garbage, right? And you have to give a little tug on the leash. So mind the gap is a way of doing that. The way mind the gap works is if you have a thought and maybe the thought is, gosh, I'd love to, you know, join the Peace Corps, but, oh, that's something only kids right out of college do. Or my sister already thinks I'm crazy. She works in corporate America. Now she'll probably never speak to me again. Or my kids will think I'm having a midlife crisis. They'll probably, you know, try to have me put away if I do that. (laughs) Right. So, so you had a thought and you immediately made meaning, right? There was no gap between the thought and the meaning you make of it. When you embrace this very first mindset practice called Mind the Gap, you do, it's a three-step process. You say, what are the facts? What's the meaning I'm making of it? And is there a more empowering meaning I could make? So you kind of take back ownership of the meaning you make of the event. Now, the event could be a thought you had, or it could be something happening to you. Like you send an email and the person doesn't answer you. 
And your mind immediately runs down that, goes down that rabbit hole of, oh, they don't think I'm important enough to write back to. They're ignoring me. They hate me. It's that stupid thing I said at that party two years ago. They still haven't forgiven me. <laughs> Who's ever been down that We've rabbit hole? We've all been down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I certainly have. And I had that happen to me recently where I reached out to someone who runs a community I'm part of, a very powerful women. And, I, you know, it's about 400 of us. And many of the women in the community are very famous, right? I'm an author and a coach, but I'm not very famous. I'm not a household name. So I wrote to the head of the community and say, oh, I'd love to have a meeting with you. She didn't write back. I thought, oh, well, okay, well, she's busy. I'll just bump it up. I'll, you know, try again. So I wrote her again. Oh, hey, I'd really love to have this meeting with you. Maybe you missed the email. Mm, didn't write back. Well, then I started going down the rabbit hole, right? Well, I'm not famous. The other women in the group are more important. She probably doesn't want to make time for me, right? This whole story. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute. I've got to use my own mindset practice. Mind the gap, right? So I said, okay, what are the facts? Fact is, I sent her an email. She hasn't written me back. What's the meaning I'm making of it? That she doesn't want to talk to me. She thinks I'm not worth it, et cetera. Step three, what's a more empowering meaning I could make? And just by asking that question, I shifted out of this negative mode and I remembered that I had had several people that same week tell me that my emails were going into their spam. So I called my assistant, because we're all working remote now, and I said to her, hey, could you resend my email from your email and just ask her if by chance it's in her spam? 15 minutes later, we had an answer. Oh, hello. I'm so glad you sent this. Yes, it was in my spam. I'd be happy to meet with Julia. How's Friday? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So what if you didn't mind the gap? What if you didn't have that tool? And we do this all day, every day. So, you know, that's just one of the eight practices, but I think it speaks to what you were just asking about, Ellen, where, you know, what can we do? What we can do is learn mindset practices because we have zero control over what's happening out there, right? It just gets crazier and crazier as far as I'm concerned. We think it's over. It's not over. The kids go to school. The kids come back from school. I have two teenage kids. So for me, every day that they can go to school is a good day. Right. But we can't control that. We can only control what we do with it and how we process it and get through our day. Absolutely. We usually close our episodes, Julia, by asking our guests to give us two takeaways they'd like our listeners to take away from this. And I'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. Wonderful. Well, I think I'll give two quick mindset assignments. So the first one is the next time you find yourself going down some negative rabbit hole, whether it's self-censoring thoughts or something someone said to you, I'm going to invite you to remember, mind the gap, just like in the London tube, and to run this three-step process of what are the facts, what's the meaning I'm making of it, and what's a more empowering meaning I could make. And that alone could be a game changer. So that's homework number one. Homework number two is to think about, do I have any limiting beliefs that are keeping me from going after my dream? Because that's one of the mindset practices I teach is how to bust through limiting beliefs. And if you're wondering, how do I know if I have a limiting belief? Some people are thinking, oh yeah, I know I have limiting beliefs. I know that term. I've read books about it. And other people are thinking, what what is that? How do I know if I have one? And the way you know if you have a limiting belief is if you look around at your life and say the amount of meaning you have, the amount of you know money you have, the friendships you have, wherever you feel you're lacking, like there's something you want, but you don't have it, there's a limiting belief behind that. Because if you didn't have a limiting belief, you would have it already. And that's where the mindset work can just be a game changer for you. If you can bust through those limiting beliefs, you can get out of self-sabotage into that empowered go big mindset and really start pursuing the things that are going to light you up and give you meaning and hope no matter what the world throws at us. So those would be my, my top two recommendations. Those are wonderful. I love that limiting yeah, belief. I, that. I mean, there's so many limiting beliefs, yeah. particularly women we all have. And it does. it's not always just our skills or whatever. It's our looks, our weight. You know, all of those kinds of things play into limiting beliefs, I think. It's the number one thing I help women with is overcome limiting, limiting beliefs as a mindset coach, not as a scaling coach on the business right. side. And, and if people want to follow me, I'd love to have you in my universe through social media. I'm on Instagram at Julia Pimsler, um, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So just come find me. I'm very active on all of those. We will. And we'll also share that all in our episode notes and certainly in our social media when we promote the episode. So Julia, I'm glad I ran into you in the coffee shop and I'm glad we started chatting. So am I. So thank you yes. for joining us. This was really fun. It was terrific. I loved it. Yeah, great to be with both of you. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Denise. And uh, I'll see you at, at, at the coffee shop, I Absolutely. hope. Absolutely, on the west time. side. Let's go. <laughs> okay, hey, everybody stay safe and go big. Yes. 
Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. My pleasure. Well, after that interview, I feel like I've got a lot to work on. I think Julia made it all seem so easy, but for me, it's going to take some hard work to get my mindset on the course it needs to be. She ended the episode with two mindset exercises for us to practice. If you like the exercises and are interested, Julia is offering our listeners 50% off her program, 21 Days to Go Big Mindset. Usually it costs 49, but at half price, it's under 25 bucks. I think it might be worth the cost. The link to the program is in our episode notes, and you just have to put in the code GOBIG50. Let's all try it and see what we think. Anyway, we all need to work on living our best lives, feeling good about ourselves, and ignoring what others think, and trying our best, I think, to stay off social media. If any of our listeners have thoughts or experiences on how they've built their lives after the adult kids are on their own, share them with us on social media. Let's form our own community and support each other in finding this bliss. You can find more out about Julia by visiting her website at juliapimsler.com. Pimsler is spelled P-I-M-S-L-U-E-R. I'll have links to her books, website, and social media in the episode notes. And finally, listeners, we're waiting for your questions for our monthly episode called We're On It, where we find the best experts to answer your questions. Just email us your questions at biteyourtonguepodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, remember... Sometimes you just have to bite your tongue.